Namaste everyone and uh, welcome to this Balances Better Q&A. My name is Hamish Rogers. I am a sport development consultant with Sport New Zealand and lead of the Balance Better website. And today on our Q&A, we're joined by Vince Manaris. Vince is currently the development officer at Harbour Basketball. And in addition, Vince is a regional coach developer and a national sport trainer for Sport New Zealand. Vince recently earned his PhD in coaching and pedagogy. Vince, I'll get you to talk a little bit more about that. And if you haven't picked up by the accent, hails from the States. He's had a focus prior to your time in New Zealand with high performance basketball and football athletes and both men's and women's. The scope of today's Q&A is going to be leaning into your research with a specific interest around athlete decision making. And pretty much unpacking the common questions we hear from coaches around, well, why do my athletes keep making the same mistakes? By the way, Vince, congrats on completing the PhD. I know we have any conversations about that, so well done. Should we be calling you Coach Doc now? You know, there's some truth to the doctor, but uh, I, I like just being called Vince. That's, that's fine. <laughs> sure. Thanks for the opportunity, though. Really excited. Awesome. Thanks, Vince. To frame our discussion today, I know you had a really good story, but we might kick on to that story in a second. Maybe before we do that, do you want to just talk a little bit about... Yeah, kia ora. Thanks, Hamish, for having me on. We go back quite a ways, so this is a really cool opportunity for me to, to not only talk about my PhD and, and share some tips with coaches, but also to do it with you. Yeah, look, came to New Zealand in 2014, wanted to pursue a PhD in coaching and pedagogy, which is really, you know, the practice of teaching and learning in sports specifically. My background is very much in player development and the ways in which we can do that to sort of acknowledge the human side of things. Uh, I think the bounce is better messaging and the programming itself really speaks to my interest in doing sport and doing coaching in a way that honors the people that we're working with. I think that will come out quite a bit today as we talk about kind of a quite common coaching problem, which is responding to player mistakes, which I think is an area ripe for conflict and tension and we do need to kind of wrap our head around. So excited to chat about that and 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 broadly about the field of coaching and how it is really about people, right? And I think mm, that's, a, yeah. that's a, that a lot of people can resonate with. Yeah, the, 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 well, let's dive in. When we were kind of broadly having a chat about this before we jumped online, you mentioned, let's frame this with a good story. I know you've got one. So I'll hand it over to you to share. Yeah, I guess just as the premise, you know, there's a recognition that in coaching, a lot of the process of coaching is very much about, you know, player development, collective learning, uh, improvement of team. And there's lots of different ways to do that. And I suppose one of the key practical questions that coaches always have is when players make mistakes, how do I respond? What I'm going to do now is, is just walk you through a, a little sort of vignette, a little case study from some research that I did a few years ago as part of my um, doctoral research where I, I spent a year with a high school basketball team. And the goal of that project was really to dive into the learning experience itself um, and to try to get caught up in the weeds, I think, of how messy that process is and help coaches really get an appreciation for what they do have control over over and, and what they don't. To kind of walk you through this particular case study, we've got a student, we're going to call him Nathan. Without giving you anything about Nathan, we just want you know to, you to watch this these two possessions of basketball offense. Now, this is a high school boys basketball team, um, and what we want to do is watch the boy in the yellow shirt and just try to get a sense for how he's playing and what the potential conflict is. So we'll just play this and see, uh, see what you know. Now, I know you're a footballer, and, but you've watched a little bit of basketball there. When you watch these two sequences and you can follow along with the boy in the yellow shirt, what, what's your first impression about what's happening here and, and what the issue might be? 
The thing that stuck out to me was you could hear whether it was the coaches or the collectively the team, there was more than one person shouting to him in that second phase of play, move it, move it. So to me, I think what the issue at hand is, is probably around speed or quickness of moving the ball. I'll let you talk to that, but I can see how that pins down into athlete decision making. Yeah, so we're talking here about mistakes and decision making, obviously, and we're talking about a mistake. And mistake actually might be a harsh word, right? You know, it wasn't a turnover. He didn't lose the ball. But there was a moment there, particularly in the second clip, where he caught it and he held it and he paused. And he really, I think we called it, he hesitated. And, mm -hmm. and that hesitation, from a coaching perspective, that hesitation, there was a there's an issue there. The, the, you heard it from the team. You heard it from the players sort of saying, hey, move it, move it, move it. So they want him to do something different from what he currently is. Now, again, you might not call that a mistake, but we, we why don't, for the sake of it, let's call it a conflict. A conflict in decision-making or an issue in decision-making. Well, I think what's interesting about, you know, as a coach and our, the coaches who are watching might be thinking immediately about what they might do in that situation. But when you talk to this particular player, Nathan, about the situation, here's what he had to say. He said, I don't want to take the first shot because it may be on the first pass. And if I miss, I might look bad. But with this style of training, the first shot always looks like the worst shot. I want to make sure I deserve my place. I just want to be better for the team. So at initial kind of investigation, you see that there is something going on in terms of how he's perceiving the situation of the team, not just perceiving the game. He's got some concerns about um, his connection to the team, how he'll be perceived by his teammates, and also sort of a misunderstanding of the way in which the team is playing and some confusion about the style. So when we probe a little bit deeper, what, what he sort of brings out is this idea that the, the motion offense or the offense that's playing is something new to him. He says the flow motion is something that I've never done. It's not like you have a play um, where you go to a particular spot or have a job for the spot. You kind of go wherever you are on the court and I'm just getting a little confused. I don't know how to score. And I think in this comment in particular, you have probably the essence of the conflict, which I've kind of drawn up here as, on the one hand, this probably comfort in a more structured setting where he's been given a specific job for a particular spot and he does that thing as characterized by the neat, clean lines on the left side. And on the right side, you've got this more open, what he perceived to be this very open freelance style where you can kind of do whatever. And this is the essence of what, of where the mistake comes from, which is his construction or his perception of what is being asked of him. And obviously that's a much deeper issue beyond simply what many coaches might have resorted to initially, which could have been something like a lack of confidence, or I hear this all the time, you know, a low basketball IQ, things of that nature. I, I think, and this is the heart of what we want to get at to, which is where is this conflict in play coming from? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, it, it, it makes me think about some of the times that I've coached players in the past and probably I'd say I've been guilty of, of not unpacking the conflict. Right. And I think unpacking is a really good word because, you know, I'd like to share a little bit more about not just the conflict in his understanding of the situation, but also the context and the word context is a word we use often in research, but in the practical sense, in the coaching sense, it means, you know, where are we? When are we? What, what is, where, where do we fit in the lifespan of the team and the player? That matters, you know? And I think when you start kind of unpacking this, you learn a couple things. One is this particular training, you'll see from this little graphic, that video came from early in term one, and he was a player who's just moved schools. And, and that's part of his story. He's just moved schools. He's come into a new training environment where there's new people, there's new players. Of course, he's going to be unsure. Of course, he's going to be hesitant because he doesn't know and he hasn't built the connections with people. What he also is, is impacting is that he's playing with a group of players who had spent all of term four going through a process. And that term four process was trainings and film. So they have already entered the term predisposed to what the coaches are trying to do. Ironically, he didn't actually make his comments about how he was feeling about it until nearly the end of the term. And in this graphic, the squares represent games, the circles represent film sessions, and the 
the green circles represent film sessions and the blue circles represent training sessions. And so you can see there's, there's a time span to the learning process. Where are you in the journey, both as an individual and with respect to the team? I think that this particular situation had some issues around this player playing in, in a new style of training as well. This was more of a game focus where there was no set plan. It was more read the situation that was new to him. And, you know, we did lots of things like two on twos with dribble rules and things of that nature where the players were free to make decisions. I, I think most importantly, though, more than anything, I think this conflict for this player, for Nathan, is a conflict of the structure of basketball. Players trying to get a sense for, you know, how basketball is meant to be played or how the sport is meant to be played. And it can be something you have to tease out. It certainly requires a relationship. Th this research was a lot about diving into the player's perceptions and experiences of learning to play a new form of basketball. And that was a, a motion offense, which is very different from a set structured play type of basketball. You'll see in this quote, we, we've got players talking about to read and make reads. And yes, there isn't a structured sequence or prescription. There's a freedom, but with that freedom comes potentially some anxiety or some uncertainty if you're not sure what to do. What we are seeing with this player, whereas some of the other players have probably already crossed the threshold and being able to kind of understand that that was the way that we wanted to play. And this is an example of how we were actually structuring it in terms of some of the rules that we had for play. You know, there was some stuff around training design, but I think that by and large, when we put them into this training environment, I think Nathan in particular struggled a little bit with the conversational element of it. We were asking their opinions. You know, we were asking them to... Um, make decisions and talk through what they were experiencing. That was all new um, and different. But I, I think that more than anything, the thing that I want to, you know, kind of speak to is when you start breaking down where conflicts come from and where mistakes come from, part of what we learn very quickly is that players have been coached in many different ways, sometimes all at the same time. So in this instance, we had a player who was being coached in multiple environments. There was contradictory information. You had a skills trainer saying, get to the rim. You had a, a granddad saying, take it all the way. And parents are coaches too. You had a rep coach who was telling him, run this scheme and go to the corner and fill the corners and shoot it if you're open. And then you had this particular environment of the school where he was being asked to read the game and decide what's best based on what you see. No one is wrong here. Really what we're trying to highlight is that sometimes these mistakes that players make are really just the, the natural product of being in multiple environments at the same time and trying to make sense of all of that. You know, players play off habits. They've got lots of kind of instinctual responses that they do that they've built up over time. And when you come into a new environment, it can be hard to just simply stop doing those things. And I think a lot of coaches, because we don't really think about where they've been or what else they're doing, we're really just focused on our team. We can run into problems by assuming that a mistake is consciously done, that they're just not following what the coaches did or they're selfish or they're not interested in learning what the coach is trying to do when often that's not the case, particularly when you unpack their journey. So I know that's sort of a long piece there, but hopefully you can see that, that in this instance, we have a story where the mistakes or the conflicts in decision-making are, are actually, they make sense when you really dive into it and try to understand what's going on in the players' lives. Really fascinating, Vince. A couple of questions that, that come to mind for me is for the coach themselves in order to go through this, let's call it a process of action and unpacking, what does that look like? What's the entry point for a coach to be able to start? Let's say they've flagged an athlete is making continuously to make the same mistakes. How do they start peeling that back? What What are the practical applications for a coach? Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. Obviously, the first starting point is to say that as a coach, recognizing that mistakes happen, right? Mm -hmm. it, it starts with your assumptions not even the work of working with the players, but it starts with your assumptions. You know, mistakes happen. It's part of the game, you know, particularly invasion games, they're messy. Players make mistakes, um, they make errors. Sometimes they're in their control. A lot of times it may not be. So what is your position towards mistakes? Number two, 
if you want to engage in a process like this as a coach, where you feel that learning the stories of your players, which I would recommend everyone does anyway, because, you know, that creates a more intimate connection between players and coaches. Well, you need a relationship and that relationship begins the second that team is formed, you know, having rapport, talking to players, talking to everyone, not just as basketball players, but as people, having chats with them, you know, away from the team or on the sidelines. Th those are the two sort of first points. And then when a conflict happens, you're ready to jump in and you're ready to jump in to try to understand first. And I think there's a classic sort of Stephen Covey, you know, seek first to understand then to be understood. But that really applies here. I think that coaches can do a lot more to try to understand the worlds of their players. Where else are they playing? What else are they doing? What are the other messages they're receiving? Before I jump in and say, do this my way. And, and I think there's a, an important nuance there that is really important because when you're a coach who's trying to develop players, you understand that that process is not straightforward. They're going to interpret things differently. They're going to try it. They might struggle. There's, there's so much um, that could happen. And I think coaches definitely need to be patient while, while at the same time saying, hey, we're trying to do this. I'm going to work with you to help you figure out how to do this. But I know that you might be dealing with some things. And think about it. How many kids would willingly volunteer some of this stuff to a coach? Mm. The conflicts, the misperceptions, the things that they're struggling with, they're going to just internalize them unless you ask. And I think it's incumbent upon coaches, if they're really invested in the learning process, to figure out what makes these kids tick and what's going on. And, uh, and silence is not consent. You know, just because kids are silent doesn't mean that they are happy or they fully believe what's going on. I think a lot of coaches mistake that. And I think that making the time to have those conversations with players and really learn what's going on, in particular, learning how else are you being coached? How else are you being coached? How else have you been coached? How are you dealing with that? Because everyone is dealing with that in one form or fashion, given that we are, want so many kids to play sports. Mm. It, it, it is it, it's certainly fascinating. It mirrors a lot of conversations I'm having around the sector at the moment around our coaches even inquiring around who else is coaching their athletes. And not just, as you said, not just coaching, there's, there's a myriad of other different stakeholders now who are we're inputting mm. into the experiences that these young people are having, right? Are there any key practical takeaways? We have coaches who live and breathe in a pretty busy world. Where do they start and, and how do they make steps into this space where they're not just getting to know their players better, but their context, their histories, their stories, and then weaving that into their own decision-making about how do I support this young person to develop? I encourage coaches to stop turning immediately to these sort of quick judgments. Just stop it, you know? He's selfish. He's lazy. She doesn't know how to play. She doesn't want to learn. She's got a bad attitude. All of these quick labels are harmful. They're harmful because what they do is they create narratives about players. And then coaches, once they have these narratives around players, they turn blinders on. They don't mm -hmm. want to go past those labels. It's easy. It's easy to coach the players who are not making mistakes or who you already understand and connect with. It's much harder to do this with the players who maybe are making mistakes or struggling, who you haven't connected with, Man, if you start telling yourself that, that this player fits in this box without doing the work of really learning their story, well, then that's a problem. And so I think the first thing you can do is it, stop building these simple, quick judgments or narratives of kids um, without doing the work of learning about who they are and, and, and what kind of life they're leading outside of your team or, or what kind of things they're struggling with. Obviously, the second piece is you don't have to go above and beyond with this, but you got to make some time to talk to players. I would argue that particularly road trips is the time to do this. Mm -hmm. A great time to do this, to have those kind of chats with players and their parents. Are you making some time to have quick chats to let your players know that you are available for them if they're struggling with anything? And you don't always have to say, hey, sit down with me and tell me what's going on. It can be more of, hey, talk to the group, message us, text us, what, whatever it is, the platform that you're using, you need to be available for players to, to openly share with you what they're struggling with. And you need to sometimes be extra proactive with players who you know are particularly quiet or who have a lot on or who um, maybe are getting extra pressure somewhere. Those are the kids you might have to do extra work with 
who you might want to put some extra time in, in terms of maybe you need to have that one-on-one, -on -one. maybe you need to have a regular call with the folks, maybe you need to do some film session with them. I would say that film is also particularly valuable. I, I know that when we did this particular study, we got as much out of the film study as we did the on-court sessions, particularly when it comes to decision-making. Film doesn't lie, and it's a bit more black and white in terms of players seeing what they maybe struggle to see while they're playing. I think when you're dealing with players who are making mistakes, particularly if they're repeatedly making the same mistakes, one of the issues that we have is they've probably got some bad habits. And habits are notoriously difficult for changing just through instruction or even some games. And I've found that the, the combination of film plus open, non-judgmental conversation and non-judgmental is key. Have film sessions. They don't, the sessions we did with these groups were often only about 20 minutes. And often we would just let you know, the group collectively watch what was going on unedited. I know a lot of video tends to be heavily edited, but watch some unedited things. Look for patterns collectively so that everybody can land on a small number of things that apply to everyone. Then, you know, if you've got the time, I might do some specific stuff with an individual player. But from a decision-making perspective, what we want to do is make the sort of non-conscious habits is fundamental to learning. If you want players to make shifts in their style of play that they own, we need them to become aware of what the changes need to be. So I think those videos, using that film session selectively, but like really, really intentionally can be very good. I know for us, shot selection was the core issue of this mm -hmm. team. So we watched a lot of shots being taken. <laughs> and what we learned very quickly is Yep. So once you start watching shot selection as a group, you see a guy who maybe consistently takes bad contested shots. You also, though, see that sometimes that's not his fault. It might be because the spacing is bad and players aren't making themselves available. And that was actually one of the key learnings from this group was that sometimes a bad shot is not always the fault of the player. With the ball, it could be the, the fault of poor spacing by teammates. And then people start to understand, well, he's not selfish. He's actually just doesn't have anybody to pass to because no mm. one's moved into space. And I think that those are the kinds of things that can come out of it if you approach it in a non-judgmental way where, hey, let's just try to figure this out. And I think that, you know, that's like both a pedagogical thing in the sense of a, a coaching tactic, but it's also a culture, you know, like let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt that, that people are trying to do their best and they maybe just don't realize what they're doing wrong. There's a lot there some of the key things I'm taking away that are flowing around my head is, is obviously making the unconscious visible and it's something I haven't thought about too much before. Film being a really good way to do that. I can also see the, the value of film being there's a time between an event and then being able to review it. And then, as you said, just taking the time to know your athletes, tactically creating space as a coach to do mm. that. As you said, the road trips, away games those those being really good spaces so i'd encourage other coaches to think about what are the other spaces that i can circle off as a space not just to kind of do sport coaching but but get to know my athletes better is there anything else you kind of want to share or any other key takeaways yeah i mean a couple i, I think kind of a couple of things to kind of finish off one, yeah. one is we we hear a lot about you know coaches encouraging mistakes Hmm. learning from failure. We know that growth mindset is all about this kind of a positioning of mistakes are necessary for growth. What we don't hear as much about is the actual process of learning from mistakes. And that process is not entirely on the player. It's also part of the environment that they're in. So we as coaches, we send a lot of big signals in how we work through mistakes with players. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I increasingly have done is stopped using even the word mistake as a coach and just think more about a conflict. And learning is about the resolution of conflict. It's about the elimination of that kind of, you know, issue that's there until a new one comes. But, but you know, that process of learning from mistakes is, is a partnership. 
and, and it's not entirely on the players to simply stop doing the thing. We as coaches need to give them the freedom to talk about it, to experiment with new ideas, to watch themselves on film, to think about where their conflicts might come from, because I think the players might land on some things that we don't. And that's crucial because they're the ones who are playing. But I think the biggest thing is really that we're, we're talking about a, a learning process that's not straightforward and it's yeah. not going to be resolved simply by just correcting mistakes, certainly punishing players for making them, you know, you know, we haven't even remotely addressed that side of it, which is usually where coaches start, right? If there's one thing to take away. It's there's always something happening beneath the surface. And, and just because, you know, players made a mistake or, or struggling, you know, they're not a bad person. <laughs> they, they're not selfish. There's problems to that and learning that because, you know, we're coaching young people who are developing.